Jesus, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you uh, for life in a room where we get to share with each other, where we get to talk about what's going on. Lord, all of us come here with different parts of our weeks in hand. Lord, we don't check ourselves at the door, but we bring all of who we are into this place. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that as we wrestle with the reality of the storm in Jonah, that you would help us to lay honestly and openly how we feel with you. Lord, and that you would meet us there. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your good gifts. Thank you for the ways that you love us. I pray today that you would give us eyes to see what you're calling us to and ears to hear. And Lord, for me, uh, as I speak, that it wouldn't be my words, but your words. And that above all else, you would get glory in this place. So in your name we pray. Amen. In August of 1819, the whale ship Essex sailed away from the shores of Nantucket. They left on a two and a half year assignment hunting uh, sperm whales for oil. And as they went out on this lucrative journey, there were lots of hopes and dreams caught up in this ship. One of the, as they left, one of the unique things about this journey is that a lot of journals were recovered or people wrote later on, as we'll come to find out, about the story. And one of them, the cabin boy, Thomas Nickerson, wrote this as he left the shore. Then it was for that I, for the first time, realized that I was alone upon a wide and unfeeling world without one relative or friend to bestow a kind word upon me. See, they realized really quickly that their journey would be a lonely one. It would be one that they would be out and adrift at sea by themselves. From the very beginning, the, the trip was actually somewhat of a failure. They had a hard time finding whales to hunt in the ocean, in the Atlantic. They were beset by storms that caused damage to their ship, and they came across different fished out hunting grounds as they went up and down the coast. And so hearing of a tip that if they went around to the Pacific Sea, they'd be able to find more whales, they decided to go. And this is where the story turned from just bad to apocalyptic. November of 1820, they were out in the ocean and they saw a large bull sperm whale out at sea that came quickly at them and rammed the boat. Actually, a newspaper later on depicted it this way. It rammed the boat twice, sinking the ship. And as it sunk the ship, they were in the middle. Of the, many of them escaped and they got on different rafts and they created different floaties and they had uh, some of their boats and they stayed, all the whale boats, and they were around the ship and they stayed as long as they could because it was the closest point to harbor that they had in the middle of the ocean. Eventually they had to leave, leading them on a journey where they went to an island that was uninhabited, leading them uh, to be attacked by more whales, believe it or not. And eventually some of them made their way home. There's a great book on this called In the Heart of the Sea, if you ever want to read about it. In fact, this is the story that, uh, Tom, or that Herman Melville got Moby Dick from, the true story of the whale ship Essex. See, Thomas Nickerson, when he left the port, never knew how right he would be in his feeling of, be, of being adrift in a wide and unfeeling world. Now I'll venture a guess that no one in here has ever been in a boat that was sunk by a whale or that you've just been stuck in the middle of the ocean on a life raft. Maybe I'm wrong. If I am wrong, please come talk to me afterwards. I'd love to hear the story. Yet this feeling of being adrift in a wide and unfeeling world is not unique to being stuck in the middle of the ocean. Because all of us have felt this at some point in our life, whether it's the pain of losing a loved one, the hurt of watching a child leave the faith, the, an addiction that you don't feel like you can overcome, the consequences of sin that weigh heavy on you, or a myriad of other issues that we could go down the line. We all feel adrift at moments in our proverbial seas. And it leads us to doubt and to struggle with God. We will all face storms in our world, 
and we wonder what we're supposed to do with them. How will we survive the shipwrecks that we face? What do we do when these things arise? Where do our storms come from? When we face the storms in life, what will we do? What's the result of our storms? And can anyone lead us out of them are all questions that come to mind. And these are certainly some of the questions that Jonah and the sailors faced as they were bandied about by a great storm. It took them, it shook them to their very core to be confronted by the reality of the storm that was at hand. But at the same time, they were met by the magnificent mercy of God in the midst of the storm. So if you have your Bibles or your phones, open up to Jonah chapter 1. And as you turn there, let me remind you about the context of the story of Jonah. Jonah is one of the most interesting and complex books in the entire Bible. It's a book that has layers and hyperlinks all throughout Scripture. It's a book that's really difficult to classify in terms of genre. In fact, there have been um, up to like 12 genres that have been assigned to the book of Jonah. The way that I like to think of Jonah is it's like a good kid's movie. It's a good kid's movie that has jokes that the parents understand and that the kids understand, and it has layered storytelling all throughout it. This is the book of Jonah. It's one that's hard uh, to get to the end of. There is a ton going on and depths to be plumbed all throughout the story. But at the core of Jonah is this, that God's mercy and grace are for all people, even those that you don't think deserve it. We see God's grace and how God cares for the Gentile sailors and the city of Nineveh, that even to the pagans that were the enemies of the people of God, God loves them and has mercy upon them. But we also see God's mercy in how he cares for Jonah, the unfaithful prophet that runs away from, all, from God will also receive God's overwhelming mercy. And in Jonah, we find that God's capacity for grace out, uh, exceeds our capacity to sin, that God's love is boundaryless, that God is a missionary God calling his missionary people to proclaim the good news of repentance in both word and deed, lifting our needs and the cries of our hearts to him, trusting the Holy Spirit to work. God's mercy and love can transform us, our neighbors and our world in ways that we can't fathom. But before we get to that reality, it starts with seeing how we actually view our neighbors. Last week, we talked about how the book of Jonah searches us, functioning as a theological and sociological mirror. It forces us to confront our identities and how we view our en enemies. It forces us to ask, to ask openly who God is. And if we trust that his good news is for those who don't look like you, think like you, act like you, or vote like you. Last week, we took a look at the context of Jonah and why he ran away from God. But this week, we want to look at another part of the story in the opening chapter, the storm. What's going on in the midst of the storm, in the minds of those who are encountering it? How do they confront it? This is what it says, starting in verse 4 of chapter 1. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the land and the sea. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. 
Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more temptuous. And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleases you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The story begins with a really violent image of God hurling a storm at those who are in the ship. That word hurling is actually the same word that would be used to describe a warrior throwing a spear in battle. It's this idea that Jonah's sin has consequences, and those consequences affect those around him. Panic breaks out on the ship as the ship threatens to break apart. And they do the things that they know to do in a storm. They lighten the load, they batten down the hatches, they turn toward shore, but none of these work. And the storm rages around them, and it says that the ship threatens to burst which is actually a unique way to describe this. It's a really violent image, probably reflecting the violent image of hurling the storm at them. So it says that each man turned to their gods to pray. It's interesting. At the time, most gods were regional or even personal. Uh, Families had household gods that they worshipped. In fact, if you Uh, read the Old Testament, the name Baal comes up often. And Baal is often thought of as like some kind of major deity, but really Baal was a series of regional deities that different kingdoms worshipped. And they, different Baals had different powers over different things. And sometimes those Baals were even personal to your home. They were your own personal deity. And that may sound silly to us to think about now, But if we're being honest, we also do this too. Uh, One of my favorite movies is Talladega Nights, a Will Ferrell classic. And one of the great scenes in that movie is where they're sitting around the table having a prayer. And as they pray, Will Ferrell's character prays to eight pound, six ounce baby Jesus. And then they start going around the table debating how they view Jesus. And one of his sons says, I like to think of Jesus as a ninja. And then I hear one of the other guys goes, I like to think of Jesus as a guy at a concert wearing a Leonard Skinner shirt. And I'm about to punch him in the face. And I think to myself, I can't punch him in the face. That's Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) And it's a silly representation of how we actually do this as well, right? We personalize our deities. We form them in our image at moments. In the storm, these sailors turn towards their deities, hoping that they will save them for the storm or give them answers on how they can appease the gods of the sea because the gods of the sea were terrifying. If you go through the ancient creation myths, there's a lot going on when it comes to the ocean. The Babylonian creation myth, Tiamat, is the god of the oceans. She's the sea deified. And she's also the god of chaos. And when she rebels against the chief deity Marduk, what she does is raise her children, monsters from the sea, to go and fight the Babylonian deities. And when she loses, what happens is all of her children get driven back into the sea where they currently live. The Canaanite tradition, Yom, the god of chaos in the sea, had to be subdued by Baal before he could establish order and assume his throne. And you'll guess that Yom lived in the sea. See, here, they don't only fear for their lives, but they also fear that they'll be taken into the depths of hell by the gods of chaos. Who can save them? What they don't realize is that Yahweh, the Lord, 
is conspiring with creation itself to get Jonah back on track. And even the vast chaos of the sea can't undermine the power and plan of God to save those far from him, but rather are his tools. See, unlike any of the other gods, Yahweh controls the wind and the sea and even the giant fish that'll swallow up Jonah. Psalm 81 says that Yahweh is king over all the gods and no power in the world is not under his feet. In Exodus, we actually see God say, I defeated the gods of Egypt. I put them in their place. See, Yahweh is king even over the ocean. But the sailors don't know this yet. The sailors wake up Jonah, commanding him to pray as well, hoping maybe that his personal deity will save them. Maybe they'll figure out who's responsible if Jonah talks with his God. And from here, it's a whirlwind. Jonah stubbornly refuses to talk to God throughout the story. While the Gentiles act like actual Hebrews, followers of Yahweh, cast lots and find out that Jonah's to blame. And they desperately question Jonah, asking if there's anything that they can do to appease the Lord. And finally, Jonah relents and gives them the solution. Throw me into the sea. Jonah realizes by now that God is punishing him for running away from his calling. There's a consequence for his sin and others are caught up in it. And because of the, it, it's important to note that there will always be repercussion for our sin doesn't mean that God's not using it to get him back on track, but that is part of reality. And in a moment of nobility, Jonah finally sees the sailors as the desperate humans they are and has compassion, realizing the result of his sin. Theologian James Bruckner uh, notes this reality of Jonah, writing this, Jonah does have compassion on the innocent sailors, does not want them to die. He will accept death for them, not in obedience to God, but nonetheless in their place. It was heroism born of his desperate situation. And although he is disobeying God, he still believes in Yahweh's power in acting justly towards others. Even so, though, the sailors don't want to sacrifice a human life. They nobly want to keep Jonah alive, attempting in futility to row towards the shore, caring for his life when he has not cared for theirs. But they finally realize that the only way to save themselves is to listen to Jonah. So just like God hurls the storm at them, they hurl Jonah into the sea. And immediately, the storm stops. And they realize the great power of Yahweh in this moment. The fear shifts from the desperation of the sea to God, whose power is seemingly limitless. And so they go to the shore and they worship him. The implication is actually that they probably had to go to a port to offer sacrifices. Or as the Proverbs puts it, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's a story full of drama and intrigue, cinematic in its scope. And it tells the story of both the storms of life and sin and God's powerful mercy to save those who are far from him. And at the same time, it hyperlinks to all sorts of other stories in the Bible to show the power and majesty of a better Jonah. Mark chapter four, this is what it says. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with him in the boat, just as they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And when they woke him, they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the seas obey him. Here we actually have an eerily similar story to the book of Jonah. 
Again, a great storm arises against sailors, and they're unable to make their way out. They find the one who commanded the trip in the first place asleep in the bowels of the ship. And they ask if he cares that they're drowning, asking him to turn and to cry out to God because he clearly favors him for all the mighty works he's done up to this point in Mark. But here's the key difference. Instead of turning to Yahweh and saying, we'll turn to Yahweh, we'll sacrifice, and he'll clear out the storm, or Jesus just simply says, peace be still. And it makes sense that the disciples are terrified of Jesus in this moment. See, up to this point, they thought he's just a really good teacher. They've thought that he's somebody that has done incredible works, maybe like some of the prophets of old. But they were also fishermen that knew the stories of the sea. They too lived in a synchronistic society that was embedded in these creation myths, that knew about the chaos of the ocean, that knew that was where the ghosts and the ghouls dwelled. The sea is a place of chaos that only God can master. And if only God has power over the chaos of the sea, then who is this that just spoke and the rough seas turned to seas of glass? Who is in the boat with them? See, Jesus is not only Jonah in rescuing the disciples, but he's also Emmanuel, God with us. Later on in Mark 8 and Matthew 12, Jesus will talk about the sign of Jonah, where he talks about how Jesus is the greater Jonah, not the one who is sacrificed out of his disobedience to calm the waves, but rather calms the waves by the power to save his friends. And one day Jesus will emerge from the depths of Sheol after death on the cross to rescue the world from its sins, inviting all people to turn to him. See, both in Jonah and in Jesus, we see God meeting people amid their storms. And both give us a picture of the ways that storms appear in our lives and how we respond to them. Because the truth of the matter is that we will all face storms. Every single one of us will face storms in life. There's a couple of different types of storms that we'll face. When I was in college, I was home visiting uh, my family. My brother was also back from college. And him and I got in a really heated argument about life. My brother didn't like what I was studying at the time. He thought I was wasting what uh, I should be doing with my life. Uh, him and I got in this big brouhaha uh, and being the older brother, I didn't start it, but I sure finished it when I told him, your life is a joke, not the funny kind of joke. So my brother got up and drove from our house without his cell phone, and that's how we spent Christmas morning. My mom made me get in the car and go find my brother after that. See, all of us know the destruction that sin can wreak upon a life. Our brokenness injures those closest to us, or we haven't given a second thought sometimes to how our brokenness injures those around us. See, harsh words to a child and harsh words to a barista both leave scars. Or a fight with your spouse and anger with your coworker both leave wounds. Whether it's addiction or pride or arrogance, isolation, anger, lust, the search for vengeance, apathy, gluttony, or any of the many sins that have been identified throughout scripture and church history, our sin can isolate and hurt those around us. Because sin has consequences, bringing about storms in our lives and worlds. Or as Tim Keller says, the Bible does not say that every difficulty is the result of sin, but it does teach that every sin will bring you into difficulty. Sin brings about pain, both internally through the power of shame and externally through the wounding of others. And not recognizing and dealing with your sin will always eventually lead to a breakdown in some form, a storm that will rage. Or as theologian Derek Kidner observes, sin sets up strains 
in the structure of life, which can only end in breakdown. Now, please hear me say this. Not every storm is a cause of personal sin. That's the first kind of storm. The second kind of storm is that we live in a fractured world. We live in a broken world. We live in a world with broken people as well. Sometimes it's not your sin that causes a storm, but other people's sin, and you're just caught in the byproduct. But also, the world itself is just broken. At the very beginning of the Bible, it posits that we live in a world that is fractured, groaning, and raging against itself since Genesis 3. Hurricanes, earthquakes, sickness, disease, and death are symptoms of the world, not as it should be, of the infection of sin. This is also one that I know intimately as someone who lives with a chronic, lifelong uh, disease with type 1 diabetes. It's not a result of sin that someone did, but it is a result of sin in the brokenness of the world. Because we live in a fractured world that is groaning at the seams. And the reality is, is that we will all face storms in our lives. Some of them are frankly storms of our own making and sin. And we like Jonah need to learn to accept that reality. And some of them are just because of the brokenness of the world. A world groaning and longing for healing. And like the sailors, we need the mercy of God to meet us in those moments. And I don't know where everyone is in here today. Maybe you have some secret sin or maybe you're carrying some heavy weight from the brokenness of the world. And know this, God can meet you wherever you are. God is not bound to the land in the story but is on the sea and over the powers of chaos on the sea. God does not use us despite our past, but because of it, because God loves a good redemption story. But for that to take place, it starts by simply acknowledging that our world is filled with storms, broken and hard places. And while we can't always control the storms, what we can control is how we respond to them whether it's the brokenness of the world or our own sin, we can choose by responding to turn towards the storm or turning towards ourselves. See, we will decide how we respond to the storms. One of the great joys of having small children is getting to reread Dr. Seuss books. books. <coughs> Maybe my all-time favorite is the Lorax. I am the Lorax, I speak for the trees. And as you read the story of the Lorax, one of the things that's really interesting is it tells the result of brokenness in the world. A man consumed by greed, trying to make his path in the world, that chops down all the trees and leaves a plastic world with bad air. The Onceler, one of the great villains in literature. But you get to the end of the story in the Lorax, and the beauty of the Lorax is how it ends is the Onceler looks at everything he's wrought, that there's no trees, and he's talking to a young boy, and he says, but I have this one seed that I saved that can be planted, that can restore it. See, at the end of the book, he turns in, he turns in repentance to see the world restored new. See, Tim Keller writes, the Bible doesn't say that, oh, yeah, the Bible doesn't say that every difficulty is the result of our sin, but it does teach us that for Christians, every difficulty can help reduce the power of sin in our hearts. See, it's one thing to acknowledge the power of the storm and then just to sit idly by, but it's an entirely different thing to respond to the storm. Uh, if you've never met Bill, Bill's the one that plays, uh, was playing guitar. If you've never talked to him, uh, he has a boat. And uh, Bill can tell you that if you're in the middle of a storm and you just say, ah, we're going to be fine, things aren't going to end up that great for you. 
You have to respond to the storm. And notice how the sailors respond to the storm. They pray, maybe misguided prayers, but they look for answers. And in the difficult moment of what to do with Jonah, they turn to God to ask for wisdom and favor. And on the other side of the storm, they worship God for his goodness, trusting him with their lives. See, the sailors are a testimony of what it means to actively engage with God during the storm. Their lives are a testimony to the power of God and his ability to transform us. They turn to God in trust, and God meets them and saves them from the calamity that they're facing. But they aren't the only ones that are turning towards God. Even Jonah, after all his running, turns to meet God, and as he faces the consequences, God still rescues him, even though it doesn't feel much like rescue when a fish eats you in the middle of the sea. Listen, it's never too late or too early to turn to God in whatever you're going through. God invites you to come to him in the storms of life. He desires that you grow in deeper relationship with him, rooted and becoming more like him in reliance on him and his way in the world. See, there's no formula to responding to the storms of life. But there is a person that invites you into relationship with him when you face it. And while it may be in small ways, God will meet you there. And there is power in the story of God's forgiveness, love, and grace. See, we all have choices to be active or passive in the midst of the storms of life. And the invitation of God is to come to him no matter the storms you face. Because God has mighty power that can save. There's a key difference between an active and a passive response. Uh, Growing up, we would go to family reunions on the New Mexico-Texas border, um, and there's not a lot going on on the New Mexico-Texas border, but one of the things that there are is a lot of trains, a lot of freight trains that are going by. And we would stay in a hotel, uh, if you can call it that, right off the tracks of one of these trains. And if you've ever stood near a train and you've looked at it, it's a pretty magnificent thing. Like they're really big pieces of machinery and you can tell that would be really powerful. It went somewhere, but it's a different thing when you're trying to fall asleep at three in the morning and your hotel is shaking because there's a mile and a half long freight train going past your window. In the same way, there's a difference between the potential of a response and an active response to God and his mercy. See, we will all face storms in life, and we will all choose how we respond to those storms. Either running or pressing in with God. But as we navigate the storms of life, we also must never forget this truth. Who is in the boat with you? Do you know who's in the boat with you? I said this last week, and I'll quote it again. A.W. Tozer once said, What comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. We often think of God in different ways. Maybe it's a flippant friend or acquaintance who's present and helpful, but not that important. Maybe it's a magic genie that if you ask and believe hard enough, God will give you what you want. Maybe he's a slot machine God that if you trade enough good deeds and prayers and you pull the right levers... It'll all come out blessings. Maybe he's a guidance system, just helping us to work through the world slowly but surely. Or maybe God's some sort of prison warden, giving rules that just keep us in a box. See, God can often be a lot of different things to different people. But in Jesus, we see not who we think God is, but who God actually is. He's the compassionate God meeting us in the very midst of our storms. He invites us to turn towards him, to lay down our fears and worries. He has power over the chaos and brutality of life. Creation itself bends to the king over all things. But he's not just the one that calms momentary hurricanes, but calms the darkness of our world. See, Jonah emerged from the deep depths of the boat. And his sacrifice saved a handful of sailors. But as Jesus emerges from the deep uh, depths of death, his sacrifice frees us from all sin. 
See, the storms of life no longer can hang clouds over our head because Jesus has conquered the grave. And while we mourn and face storms and the brokenness of the world, we do so with hope because the God over the universe is in the boat with us. And one day he will wipe away all tears from every eye and set the world right as it's meant to be. Or as the hymn says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. See, God's grace is for you and the invitation is not to turn and earn your way back to him, rowing endlessly for shore. But instead, the invitation is to come as you are, to trust him and to be transformed. Acknowledge the storms and respond in turning towards God, casting your cares upon him and recognizing who's in the boat with you. And one day, God will cease our storms. We'll be people of the glassy sea. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we come this morning, I can imagine that many of us feel the burdens of this world. Whether that's the burdens of our lives or the burdens of the news. Whether it's the worries of a relative of the worries across the ocean. Lord, we acknowledge that we have deep sorrows about the storms of the world around us. And Lord, we ask that you would meet us here. Lord, we know that you are king over the world, that you are king over all things, and that you can transform us from the inside out. Jesus, thank you for that reality. Lord, I pray that this morning for everyone in here, wherever they're at, that they would remember the goodness of you meeting them there. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you have not left us on our own to figure out the world, to row back to you at shore, but that you come and meet us and calm the seas. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love, His amazing love. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son. Jesus is waiting, God so loves.